Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. Kelly's going to come up and speak uh, for a few minutes, man, to share a couple of things with you about a ministry, a ministry opportunity for you guys. So if you could just give her your attention for a few minutes, that would be awesome. It's a learning thing. I'm <laughs> before I start. Okay, I want to tell you the story before I start. It's a downer, but you know. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, years ago I taught elementary school, um, and I had this little boy in my class. He was a sweetheart. He was a little tiny thing, and he was a little quirky, funny. He was, you know, just. But he was very endearing and very sweet. And um, he became a teenager years later and decided he was going to go to college. And he didn't, couldn't figure out what college he wanted to go to. He was pretty much had it, a college on his, on his mind. And, um, and his father had a college on his mind, too. So the boy knew what he wanted to do. And, but his father knew what he wanted him to do. And so there became this heated argument. It was, it was pretty bad. Um, the boy was very passionate about what he wanted, and, and so was the father. So it became so heated that the boy picked up a shotgun and shot him. So in one moment, his life changed. His mother's life changed, his sister's life changed, and his father's life changed because his father died that day. That young man wasn't a carefree young teenager that was headed to college anymore. He killed his father. Know where he is now? He is a guest, <laughs> not a guest. I'm gonna say it. he's in custody of the North Carolina Department of Corrections right now. This has been several years. It's uh, probably been about five years or maybe six. I'm not sure. So in the blink of an eye, he changed his life. He was just a normal kid doing what normal kids do, and and in a blink of an eye. And I'm not saying that I'm against guns. I'm that's not my thing. I, I'm not politicizing anything. I'm just saying that that's what happened. You could be driving down the street and get a text and glance down at your phone and run a little kid on the side of the road down, and where are you going to be? NCDOC. You're going to be in jail, too. I mean, it is what it is. So with that being said, people in prison aren't necessarily the drug dealers. They aren't necessarily the rapists. They're not necessarily those people. They are all kinds of people in prison. But in the kingdom of God, no matter what you've done, because you know a sin is a sin is a sin, no matter what. You could steal a candy bar. You could murder someone. They're both sins. Um, you know, James 2.10 says, if you have committed one sin, you are guilty of all. So are we going to allow the men and women to sit in prison with no hope? I mean, what would Jesus do? Right? So we would lo he would love on them, he would minister them he, to them, he would make sure they hear the word of God, and he would bring them to reconciliation with his father, just the way we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do that. So the prison, the, the ministry I'm going to talk to you about is the prison ministry. It's a prison ministry called um, Kairos Outside, but Kairos Inside is another prison ministry that brings the love of Jesus inside the cell walls to love to, to those people, men and women, who are incarcerated and need to know the love of Jesus. In fact, that's usually where we get our guests for Kairos Outside. Kairos Outside is a ministry for women who have loved ones who are or who have been incarcerated or the women themselves were incarcerated. The person who uh, started Kairos Outside believed three things. He believed that you really needed that experience in prison with God. You needed to know Jesus. Number two, you needed the support when you got out of prison. And number three, you needed a means of making a living. So Kairos Outside is number two. We are trying to do, th we're, th we're the support. But we're trying to teach women to be the support. So when their husband is in prison and they come home, they have a beautiful, loving wife who loves Jesus like he loves Jesus. And bam, they have an amazing Jesus-loving relationship. <laughs> so Kairos Outside is the support and we minister to those women who are, have been impacted by prison. Kairos Outside is a two-and-a-half-day retreat for women who have been impacted. 
this is an opportunity for them to meet other women in a similar situation. So in, the time, in that time, we set up little family tables of roughly six people um, where they develop relationships with each other because who, who better to understand what they've been through than people like them, you know, in similar situations. The program is interspersed with fun activities, music, talk. We surprise them with all kinds of agape, which will be gifts. And we give them a birthday party. And we do other things, little surprises and fun things. And it's all free. The women are guests. It's all free. Everything is free. So we invite them to come. And we have this year a lot of guests. We have some on a waiting list, as a matter of fact. Um, but we need something else. The Kairos Outside Weekend is built and presented by a team of Christian women for the sole purpose of supporting them and serving them in a loving way. I believe we're all to be servants of God, and I'd like to give you an opportunity to serve him by serving others. How do you do that? There's several ways. You can tell others. Last year, we didn't have very many guests. This year, we're, we've got a lot of guests. But I still want you to tell others, and I want you to give me an opportunity to share. If you know someone, a group that needs someone to talk to them about this, I'm, I'm your girl. <laughs> That's my job in this ministry is outreach. Um, you can be a financial donor. The weekend costs approximately twelve dollars to $13,000. We hold it at the 4-H Center in Columbia. Um, we I place pledge cards in the lobby. Um, you can purchase meals for the guests. They're roughly $10 a piece. Um, I place an envelope with little cards in it that you can fill out. You can be a team member. This is the good one, okay? <laughs> Being a team member stretches you as a Christian woman. I'm not even kidding. So team members, okay, you are not an, if you're not an out loud, pr out loud prayer warrior, you learn to become one, okay? Because through an activity, you get one. Both, both times I've teamed, I ended up with the weekend leader. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea. <laughs> But that's what happens. They give you some kind of thing, and you match up in, in a team meeting. And you, we ha have lots of teaming activities. And we become like a family. So you get to know your, your prayer warrior partner and your other, the other women very well. <laughs> so if you uh, if you've never spoken in front of a crowd, you will learn. So that's another thing. The last weekend we did, I was chosen to do a talk. My talk, and I'm so excited, was on choices. I shared about the choices I've made throughout my life and the biggest choices that I made to rededicate my life. That was the biggest, big one. Twelve years ago in this church. Wasn't a big deal. Wasn't a big fanfare. There were no trumpets blaring, nothing like that. John Cass was here. The whole place was packed. And I was standing there. And, I, and it wasn't even anything crazy. I just said, Jesus, I mean, I need you. I want you. And please take me as part of your family. I believe in you. I know you died. I know you rose from the grave. I, knew, I know all this. So... I gave my life finally, and it took, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I rededicated 12 years ago. So and let me get, not get ahead of myself here. So anyway, that was my talk. And um, we're currently, let's see, the, um, we're currently short 12 team members. Weekend is free for the teammates, too. So you can come for that weekend as well, and it's free. Um, we do, we as team members, we do sometimes bring meals and we bring snacks for the, that weekend or whatever, but it's absolutely free for both team members. Um, we do do fundraising activities, and but you can go, and it's, it's a lot of fun, and you develop lifelong relationships, life, bleh, lifelong friendship relationships. I get cards from friends all the time. Anyway, teaming is a lot of fun. There's no grumbling. There's no whining. There's no complaining. There's nothing of that. We work hard. We have a rough, tough weekend, but we have so much fun, and we get to love on these ladies. And then a couple months later, we get to see them again at a, at a reunion. Um, you can support this ministry another way, agape. So if you're talented and you've got some kind of really cool artistic way about you, <laughs> you might can make something for these women. Um, sometimes it's like a pin. Sometimes it's barrettes with some, some kind of thing on it. Sometimes it's... Um, I don't know, cards or um, the little tiny Jesuses we see all over the place, you know. Um, sometimes it's buttons. It doesn't even matter what it is. It's a towel, hand towel that's been embroidered, anything like that. It's agape. And we give it to these women, and they are so loved on that weekend, and it's so amazing. I mean, they, they just need it. Okay, and another uh, way is one of the most important ways is prayer. This is a big one. This whole weekend is prayed over and prayed over and prayed over. From the moment that it's made, the decision's made, it's prayed over. Everything is prayed over. And in fact, last year I gave you guys these little strips of paper and you can fill these out. And we, we made a, 
around the room, and it went around three or four times, and it had your name, just your first name on it, and, and a Bible verse or your prayer for them, and that was amazing, and they walked in, and they're like, wow, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's such an opportunity. If you don't want a team, there's always day angels. Come for three or four hours that day and help set up a room, because when they leave one room and then they come back, it's changed. Everything's decorated differently. Um, you can do it with your husband. You know, you can be a day angel with your husband. And it's, it's just an amazing, and I'm sorry I'm taking so long, but I'm done. So anyway, if you want to know more about it, I'm going to be in the lobby after church. And I would love for you to come. And I'd love for you to be a part of that team. Good, you are good. Hallelujah. I guess he left this up here for me. He wants me, wants me to be a day angel. Hey, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is good all the time. We're just going to dig in briefly, man, but uh, real quick. Um, also, we have some sign-up sheets in the back. We have been getting asked like crazy about a midweek service, so we want to do a midweek service again. Uh, but what we are also asking is for people to sign up to volunteer for midweek services. That way we're not draining uh, um, our Sunday servers. And uh, so if you want to sign up for Wednesdays, sign up sheet is in the back. We're looking for people who would be willing to do kids, who would be willing to uh, um, um, usher, and so on and so forth. And uh, so we would love to have you guys, man. So um, God is good. Also, May 17th, 18th, and 19th, I promise you, you do not want to miss it. It is Holy Ghost Fire Revival. Praise the Lord. It is going to be on and popping. Thank you, Jesus. Great speaker. It's going to be phenomenal worship. Uh, um, and then they're going to settle for an okay speaker because I speak on one of those days. So praise the Lord. But it's going to be absolutely amazing. And I promise you, church, that you guys do not want to miss it. Uh, it's uh, like Sister saying, man, it's. Uh, being prayed over, uh, uh, fasted over, and just amazing things are going to take place with that. Also, thank you to everybody who showed up to the uh, food drive yesterday. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we are blessed by each of the servers. Myself, it started off as uh, myself and Dave's side. We, uh, we just killed the competition. And, uh, but, uh, but it was amazing. And then it, Dave had to go, so AJ... Uh, gladly hopped in, and we continued to kill the uh, competition. But we were grateful. We were grateful for the other side. <laughs> but it was amazing. Uh, everybody who showed up, just a beautiful team of people. Manio uh, Police Department, man, it was just a beautiful team of people who were out there to love people and to ultimately food people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, well, you know, they did. That, that's I'll give them that. That side. Well, I don't know. I'll start loving it. I mean, come on, Dave. But, uh, but praise the Lord. But it was absolutely amazing. And we're just, uh, we're blessed by each person who volunteered. And my goodness, if you could see that room back there, it's unbelievable the, uh, the amount of food that we got. So we are super, super excited about that. And like I said, we'll dig in uh, shortly, man, see what the Lord does. Um, you guys know that I love possums. Uh, um, I've told you guys that multiple times. What y'all didn't know, however, is, uh, is my love for possums goes way back uh, to when I was a kid. There was an abandoned house that uh, was next door to my grandma. And you could see the possums running around in, in the backyard or in the abandoned house. You would actually see them hanging from the rafters with their little babies clinging to their back or to their stomach. Super cool. But me and my sister and my cousins got the bright idea that what would also be fun is to try to chase and catch the possum. So now I'll be honest with you. I think it was funner, the, the concept of perhaps if we catch a possum. I don't think that we ever truly anticipated to catch a possum. I think that we were honestly too afraid when they turn around and hiss at you. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of scary. So uh, we never actually went in for the catch of the possum. But I remember nanny my grandma asked one time what are you guys going to do if you ever catch one and that kind of gets you thinking matthew 6 10 he uh, uh, jesus is talking to his disciples and uh he's talking about praying right and he says your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven now i believe that your average christian believes that they're supposed to pray this prayer 
I believe your average Christian believes that the Lord desires them to pray this prayer. But I also believe that for your average Christian, praying your kingdom come is like a bunch of toddlers chasing a possum. I think the idea sounds great. The concept of your kingdom come sounds great. The idea sounds great of catching the possum. The concept is wonderful. The game plan is on. But catching a possum as a toddler is a tad bit scary. And I think for your average Christian, for your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is just a tad bit scary. And what we would begin to notice is as Nanny's thought concept of what are you going to do if you actually catch one, as we begin to chase these, our chasing becomes slower and slower and slower, and eventually you just stop because, holy crap, what am I going to do if I ever catch a possum? For so many Christians or churchgoers, however you want to word them, the concept of your kingdom come sounds great, but the more we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven becomes a little bit scary and a little bit uncomfortable. So ultimately, we abandon the chase, we abandon the faith, and we don't really seek the kingdom come anymore. Because to pray your kingdom come means that you want to be invaded by Holy Spirit. It means that you want to be so involved, not on the sidelines, but so involved with using the gospel to take over the world. It is a prayer. It's a desire. You realize that it's a calling. It's the anointing that changes the very makeup of who you are. It changes everything within you, beginning with your heart, going to your mind, pouring out of the spirit man inside of you. Man, it's, it's, it's just leading, seeking out of your body that wherever you go, you leave residue of Holy Spirit because you are truly desiring your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. But we have to ask ourselves, like, were we really trying to catch the possum or did it sound good? When we pray your kingdom come, are we really praying your kingdom come or does it just sound good? We have to ask ourselves, am I kingdom down or am I cultured up? And as followers of Christ Jesus, we have to understand, and this is where it gets crucial. As followers of Christ Jesus, what we have to understand, this life on planet earth is the closest thing to hell that we will ever experience. Right? But the reason why our truly desiring and truly praying for your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reason why, church, this is so crucial is because for non-believers, non-followers of Christ Jesus, this life down here on planet earth is the closest thing to heaven that they're ever experienced. So we have to begin to grab a hold. Because here's the matter. Here's the truth of the matter. One day, everything's going to end. One day, the good news is, is one day your job will end. And for some of you, y'all say hallelujah. Uh, uh, one day, taxes will end. Can I get a witness? One day, uh, bills will end. Thank you, Lord. One day, sicknesses will end. One day, your tasks will end. One day, your dirty dishes will end. Your dirty laundry will end. One day, all your, your social media posts, I'm sorry, are even going to end, right? And, 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 and one day, all those, all those uh, uh, emails that you have to respond back to, you will no longer have to respond back to. And one day, your life is going to end. Your family's life is going to end. The, the world is going to end. And when that goes away, there's going to be a new kingdom that's going to come down. The kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is going to replace this earth, praise the Lord. Now, this kingdom is going to be indeed our eternal home if we are a child of God. Your residency may be in your city, in your township, in your county, but but your citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this kingdom of heaven has a king, and his name is Jesus, right? So praise the Lord for that. But where we are right now, it is referred to as living in the times between the times. And what this means is that on one hand, God has already begun this this kingdom of heaven coming down, right? And what I mean by that is he's already defeated Satan, death, hell, and the resurrection. He's already defeated Satan. 
Holy Spirit has already been given to us to empower us, to empower the church, to be what? To be witnesses for Jesus Christ, to spread the gospel from nation to nation. But on the other hand, it hasn't fully happened yet. Because unlike Jesus, we have not been resurrected from our physical death. Right now, we've only been resurrected from our spiritual death. Right now, the tribulation has not come, right? Yes, the curse, praise the Lord, has been broken. However, the final uh, um, um, trial and and the final punishment for the devil and his demons for the lake of fire has not yet been given. The kingdom of God... Has, has, has a ruler. The kingdom of God, in that kingdom, God reigns. The, the, the word uh, 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 um, is uh, basalia. Basalia is, is the Hebrew root for kingdom. Now listen, this is what it means. Royal power, kingship, dominion, rule. The definition says, not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom of the royal power of Jesus as triumphant Messiah. So what does that mean? What that means is when we pray your kingdom come, we're not praying for the, for, for, uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ. When we pray your kingdom come, we're not praying that he just completely ends everything. When we pray your kingdom come, what we are praying for is that we as believers in Christ Jesus would step into this royal power, step into this kingship, step into this dominion authority of Christ Jesus, that we would rule in the authority of Holy Spirit, that no matter where we are, that we would defeat darkness with his marvelous light, that wherever we are, we would shine his light. The kingdom of God would shine the light into the most hellacious people or the most hellacious places and transform them, manifest through them to become the most heavenly people or the most heavenly places. Right? He tells us in Psalms 103, 19. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Here's what we have to understand. Wherever God is, there is his rule. Wherever God is, he reigns. God is omnipresent, which means God is everywhere. He's everywhere. So when we pray your kingdom come, it is us stating as a people that I am surrendering my will. I'm surrendering my kingdom. I'm surrendering everything about me to your will, to your rule, to your reign, God Almighty. Jesus, in Luke's gospel, in chapter 12, makes an awesome declaration to his disciples. He tells them to fear not, little flock. Your father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. He's not talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And we'll get into the uh, differences uh, next Sunday. But He's talking about, uh, uh, at this particular, his pleasure is to give you the kingdom, the kingdom of God. The scripture, which is God-breathed, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It ministers the same yesterday, today, and forever, and praise the Lord for that. And what it's letting us know is no matter the troubles, the fears, the trials, the tribulations that we will go through in life, God has already given us everything we need in here. The kingdom of God is inside of us, right? And he has already given us the keys to the kingdom what we have to begin to start doing as followers of christ is actually operating in those keys of the kingdom we have to start walking in the your kingdom come because when we walk in the your kingdom come and we shine the light through holy spirit which powerfully goes in and invades the darkness and chases off the darkness of the world When we walk in your kingdom come, sicknesses are swept away. Sin is defeated. Demons are cast out. Lack fails to exist. And death cannot touch us. When we walk in, your kingdom come. How do I know that? Because in the kingdom of heaven and in the kingdom of God, there is no sickness. There is no sin. There is no demonic. There is no lack. And there is no death. It is life and life to the abundant. So my prayer is is that we would become a people who would truly desire your kingdom come. That we would truly surrender to to the the, the true authority and the true rule and the true power of Holy Spirit. 
that we would allow him to manifest in our life that no matter where we're at, church, that we would begin to leave a residue of his kingdom, right? Like, this is amazing. Uh, we all, um, maybe not all, but a lot of us checked out the eclipse that uh, uh, happened the other day. Super cool. The kids came home with glasses. It was super neat to steal the glasses from the kids and, you know, tell them to go do something else while we're watching the eclipse. And, uh, and, and, and it was neat, right? But what was, what was cool to me is leading up to that is NASA has, uh, and I, listen, I get it. Now, now we're going to get Facebook posts, and oh my gosh, I can't believe we mentioned NASA, and is the world flat or is the world round? I don't give a crap if the world is flat or if the world is round. What I give a crap about is that Jesus is my Savior, okay? And, and, and so I don't care what people's opinion necessarily is of NASA. What I'm going to tell you is I think it's pretty cool what the brainiacs of NASA have come out with, with the information that they're showing that science does once again prove Scripture and does not disprove Scripture like so many uh, people want to claim. But science always proves Scripture. And NASA is saying that they could go back to uh, uh, when Jonah was in Nineveh and, and show that there actually was an eclipse in, uh, in the world at that time, and, and which... Again, goes along with scripture if you read it. Uh, when Jesus was crucified, they said that they could even trace eclipses back to when that would have taken place when Jesus was crucified, which you could read that again in scripture. So it's pretty cool, right? But, but what's awesome to me too is, is if you begin to look at some of the things with NASA and some of the satellite uh, photos, it's pretty cool. And uh, I have a, a satellite photo of, of what the United States looks like lit up at night. And what's cool with that, and she'll keep that up there for a second, what's cool with that is each of those white dots uh, 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 represent a specific lit up city or an individual light source, right? Like, like, to me, that's pretty neat. And so when you look at it as a whole, it shows up as a brilliant patch of illumination, especially over here. Like, we are, we, we're just so much better than the West Coast. <laughs> no, I kid. I kid. I'm just kidding. But, but like, right, like, 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 it's, it's, it's so neat to me. Re NASA researchers, the, the, the real smart guys, uh, uh, claim that they get a lot of data off of this. And when I look at that, I'm like, of course, obviously. I mean, I could get, I could get so much data off of that. It's ridiculous. We'll prepare notes with NASA later. But, but when you look at it, and, and, and they call it luminosity data, right? Not to be confused with Illuminati data, which people can go, Pastor, just prove my point about NASA. But <laughs> Illuminosity data. Now, in, with that in mind, Matthew 5.14 tells us this. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Right? And I love this because you are the light of of the world. Neither do people light up a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, understand the word that Jesus used here in Hebrew is phos. And phos means to, uh, to be a reflector thereof. You're reflecting the light, right, which is beautiful. But it also, the other definition is to be the firelight. So you got this fire inside of you that is letting off this light. And Jesus, in probably the most famous uh, uh, sermon ever given, the Sermon on the Mount, here's Jesus, and he begins to describe what his followers look like. And he's saying, if you are a follower of me, then you have spiritual luminosity. And, and as you are a follower of me and you have spiritual luminosity, people should be able to see that. In the darkness, it should light up like a brilliant, beautiful picture, right? And what's crazy is if we could just get a map, like if we could have NASA uh, 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 do, do a map of, of Christians and God's light that is emitting from every believer on every place on the face of this earth, can we imagine what that would begin to look like? Could we imagine degree of luminosity if, 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 if we could have something that would truly indicate people's spiritual condition can you imagine how dope it would be if if ah, i'm a christian i'm a christian i'm a christian and we go okay cool come into this dark room with me for a second we're gonna click off the lights and see if you glow right 
Like, like, wouldn't that be awesome to see, like, where people truly are in their activity with Christ Jesus? Like, to me, that would just be awesome. You know, have a drone fly over them and... Pastor, there is no light. There is abort, abort, abort. You know what I mean? Ah, you know, like, like it'd be so cool. <laughs> I'm going to come up with that. I'm going to talk to somebody at NASA. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. But if we could truly just take a picture and, and see what it would look like. I, I tried to say, and I, listen, I'm going I'm to say this. Some of those pictures of people's cell phones with the eclipse, I'm going to say it's phony. <laughs> and here's why. I tried, and I couldn't get nothing. Put, my, put it over my glasses. I'm going to take a picture. Come, give me a break. NASA. You know, <laughs> that's a NASA post. No, but, but like, it's, it's, it's just crazy. I, I couldn't do it. Right, now, there were was, was some cool ones. I'll give you guys credit that. But how dope would it be if we could get a picture of all the Christians in the world lit up to see what that would look like as we pray your kingdom come. But if we could narrow that down, and just to be real with yourself, how would your picture, if they did have that, how would your picture actually look? Like, are you praying for your kingdom come in the world around you? Are you shining the light into the world of Jesus, the, the light of Jesus into the world of those around you? Are we truly praying for his kingdom to come? Are we praying that our kingdom continues to prosper? Like, like what are we asking? In Philippians 2.15, so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God, that's the word that he's given me this year is blameless. And, and when he says I can, I want to preach on that because it's going to be awesome. Without fault, wrapped or a warped or a, a crooked a generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. We have to ask ourselves, are we truly shining the light of Jesus? Because if we are, again, it's going to come up as, as brilliant spiritual uh, uh, patches of, of luminosity in Christ Jesus in our homes, in our communities. In our workplaces, in our schools, in our towns, in our cities, in our states, all across the nation. We would, beginning, we would begin to shine from the inside out. And here's what's crazy. NASA has these awesome satellite uh, uh, pictures of, of the white, brilliant light, lights that look beautiful. And as, as crazy technology as NASA has, isn't it funny that they cannot produce a picture of the electricity that produces these lights? And they can't produce the, the picture of the electricity that produces these lights because it's unseen. And then it's working through, through numerous generators, and then it's, it's going all over to the place that it needs to go. But in the same way, that spiritual uh, um, 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 uh, luminosity in us, that spiritual light in us, is generated from the unseen. And his name is the Holy Spirit. And then he allows that to shine through us. So, so when God comes down to dwell in us and through us, now we are uh, under the influence of Holy Spirit. That is when his kingdom begins to be established in us that we can then begin to go out and shine it to other people. He tells us in Luke's gospel, chapter 17. <clears throat> Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within your midst. The kingdom of God, other translations will say, is within you. Right? It's within you. If we didn't have people like Stacy uh, uh, um, uh, to do the things that they do when power goes out, then at night, our physical world would be so much darker than it actually is. Right? <laughs> like in the physical It'd be crazy. Uh, check out this picture again of NASA's satellite with a blackout. Right here is the blackout. Like, isn't that crazy? And what's nutty to me, man, is there are so many people, if we could just picture, here are the Christians, 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 ah, kingdom of God, ah, it's amazing. Blackout. 
<laughs> right? Some are not operating in the spiritual luminosity. They're operating in the blackout. And, and the, the crazy thing is, is with the light of God, if it, if it diminishes inside of us for whatever reason, then we begin to, to, to emit this weak signal, this weak spiritual light. And when that begins to take place, guess what cannot happen? The kingdom of God in your life and or the kingdom of God in the life of those around you, the kingdom of God in the world that you are connected to. But on the other hand, when the kingdom of God is, is operating the way that it's supposed to be in us and through us, his kingdom always operates the way it's supposed to, but are we willing to be the vessel to allow it to operate through us? But when we do, and, 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 and when that super, uh, supernatural power of Holy Ghost, who is that massive generator, if you would, then my goodness, church, it only, it only takes us to submit and surrender. It takes us to go, God, here's the thing. I want, I want to learn. I want to be taught by you. I want to be led by you. I want to operate in kingdom functions. Right? And then let me to, let me to uh, um, um, act on those principles that Holy Spirit is going to teach me, that your word begins to declare to me. And when we do that, when we're just simply going, hey, God, here it is, here I am, I'm a vessel, use me. When we do that, we shine, and we shine of his glory. And we shine his glory that will begin to light up the path for others to step into, to be introduced, and to become a part of God's kingdom in their lives. And when they step into and begin to operate in the kingdom of God, that produces miracles, it produces manifestations, it produces transformations. It, that's when we are sealed into the kingdom of heaven, right? But before we could be sealed into the kingdom of heaven, we need that kingdom of God. God has to come within us so that we could outwardly uh, uh, manifest of him. Basilea, right, the kingdom. And, and here's the thing. So many of us have heard teachings of the kingdoms. We've, we've heard preaching of the kingdom of God. Very few people, unfortunately, have, have revelations of the kingdom of God. Most people, unfortunately, miss the truth when it comes to the kingdom of God. They miss the benefits when it comes to the kingdom of God. And, and because they miss the truth or the benefits, what begins to happen is they can't truly apply it to their lives because they don't even understand it. And when we don't understand it and we don't, we don't uh, uh, um, apply it to our lives, now we're missing out on the process. And the process of the kingdom of God as we apply it is what changes lives. So we ask God to begin to reveal his kingdom to us through his power, through his characteristics, right? But the truth of the matter is God's kingdom, or, or not the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, God's kingdom is he desires for everyone to have it. It's not for pastors, preachers, teachers, evangelists. It's not for the worship team or, or the volunteers or the service. It's for everyone who desires Jesus. Hallelujah. Everyone who desires Jesus. And he desires us to receive it today. The kingdom of God. His sovereign rule. His sovereign government. Down here on earth. Royal power, kingship, dominion, rule. Not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but the right or the authority to rule of a kingdom through the royal power of Jesus as triumphant king. With the kingdom, the kingdom or a kingdom, any kingdom, is going to have influence and they're going to have dominion. According to kingdoms, you cannot have a kingdom if you do not have dominion and or people to rule over. The kingdom of heaven is going to operate in the same mindset. God, right, is our ruler. Praise the Lord. We, he, he, has, he has dominion, right, and thank you, Jesus. It is based on it, it, the foundation of, is of his glory. The foundation of his, is his, his power, his, his lordship, which he has established from the beginning of time, really before the beginning of time. He's established that. Now, through us, he operates in the kingdom of God in the now and in the forevermore by the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ for the people who have surrendered their life over to Jesus. A natural king 
governs territories, entities, human beings. God, as our the king of kings, governs territories, entities, human beings. God governs over sicknesses and poverty, possessed, depressed, and oppressed. Right? God is the sovereign ruler over his defeated foe, Satan. Right? And thank you, Jesus. God's kingdom, when we operate in God's kingdom, we are leading people out of the slavery of Egypt and into the promised land, while Satan is doing his best to lead people out of the promised land and back into the slavery of Egypt. Kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, are in a constant battle with the kingdom of hell and the kingdom of darkness. And I think that what happens is, is people begin to get it misconstrued. We begin to, to get it wrong uh, even when we begin to look at Scripture, right? Because we, we, we fall into this, well, the devil is the God of this world. The devil is the God of this world. The devil is the God of this world. And yeah, I get that. Yes, he is. However, the mistake that so many people make in grabbing a hold that he's the God of this world is we still cannot make the mistake to think that the kingdom of hell or the kingdom of darkness is greater than the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. There is nothing greater than the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. The only way that, the only reason why the devil is the king of this world is because the Lord allows him to be. He tells us in Psalms 24, 1, the earth is who? My God. Hello. Devil's a fake imitation of the real thing. The devil is the Lord's and everything in it, uh, the world, and all who live in it. Nothing is greater than our God. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God will always, he will always reign supreme. Why? Because he is the supreme ruler. He's the creator of the heavens, the earth, and the universe. He's the creator of uh, things above and things beneath. Our king, supreme ruler, desires, he anticipates, he created us to actually be active participants in spreading the kingdom of God down here on earth and to be an active participant in populating the kingdom of heaven. It's beautiful to me. Pastor Melando said this. He said, uh, <laughs> Pastor Melando, like <laughs> I got, I got Hispanic. I said, Pastor Milando said this. He said, God's, he said, God's invisible, eternal, and <laughs> permanent kingdom impacts the visible, physical, and natural world by the means of men and women who are born by the Spirit into the kingdom. Wherever God's kingdom is, wherever God's uh, 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 um, uh, rule is, it's supposed to be and is going to be powerful. It's supposed to be and is going to be visible. He's going to, it, it's going to be a visibly uh, uh, um, um, a demonstration of who he is. And in that, the work of the enemy must flee. Why? Because darkness cannot maintain in the same dwelling territory that is occupied by the light. My question is, in your life right now, what is your life operating in? Am I submitting to the kingdom of God or am I submitting to the kingdom of darkness? You can't be submitting to both. And if you think you're submitting to both, then I'll be honest with you, you're submitting to the kingdom of darkness. Okay? But if you're submitting to the kingdom of light, then darkness cannot be in that presence. Thank you, Jesus. And when the kingdom of God comes upon you, praise the Lord, then those individual lives will no longer be ran in sin. They will no longer uh, uh, be ran by darkness. They're, they'll begin to operate in the miraculous. Healings can take place uh, 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 of, of sicknesses and, and diseases. Why? Because we are, we are submitting to God. We are resisting the devil. We are submitting to the kingdom of God, and we are resisting the kingdom of darkness. Right? Like, it's a, a beautiful thing. I shared it not too long with you guys. Not too long ago with you guys about the uh, privilege that I had to uh, lay hands on a woman who was literally on her deathbed, uh, uh, dying of cancer. And uh, when I went in there, she she literally looked um, uh, she lo looked dead, and um, uh, she didn't know Jesus. And uh, so her husband asked me to come over and uh, pray with her and minister to her about receiving Jesus, and and we did. 
And uh, the awesome thing is, is, is right then and there, she opened up her life. She received Jesus. And I'm not lying to you. At that very moment, hey, praise the Lord, Jesus. At that very moment, um, her stiffness loosened. Um, she began to, to kind of move around. She began to actually talk. She got out of bed, and for the next three weeks, she, she was able to prolong her life in Christ, which gave her more time with her, her uh, barely teenage son. And uh, so God did amazing things. But it was so beautiful to me to see the, the visible demonstration of the presence of God literally fall upon her life and it was it was amazing and that's what he does in in and through each and every single one of us i'm getting ready to close with this but i I have to i have to explain this the kingdom of god is not the church all right we have we have to understand that the kingdom of god is not the same as the church the kingdom of god is not the same as the local church and, and I say that because we, in the church world, we have pastors, preachers, teachers, evangelists, believers, who oftentimes miss the, the revelation of, and, and intent that Scripture gives us regarding the kingdom of God. And what I mean by that is Jesus Christ spoke of the kingdom of God over a hundred times in Scripture. He was here three years when he began his ministry. We have the Gospels. Four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He speaks about the kingdom of God over a hundred times. He speaks about the local church, or he speaks about the church, too. So the kingdom of God is not the kingdom of the church, okay? And, and, and I'm going to explain that uh, uh, in a second. But when Jesus was crucified and, and, and buried and, and rose again from the dead, we know, praise the Lord, that according to scripture, according to the 500 uh, witnesses that saw Jesus uh, remained on earth for 40 days before he ascended up to heaven. And it was during those 40 days that uh, he is in um, uh, communication, intimacy with his disciples. And do you know what they were talking about? It wasn't the church. It was the kingdom of God. In Acts 1-3, he says this. After his sufferings, he presented himself to them and gave them uh, convincing proofs that he was alive. Uh, He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. And here's why I'm telling you this, that they're not the same. And and here's the the crucial point, because I know so many people are going, well, they kind of interact. They, They should, but they don't always. That's why I want to be very clear that the kingdom of God is not the same as the church. And, and, and here's why. You can grow your church in a phenomenal way, and I will restrain myself through Holy Spirit with, naming, with not naming out some churches. You can grow your church in a phenomenal way and never grow the kingdom of God. Because I'm going to teach prosperity, and I'm going to get a whole bunch of people coming because I'm going to tell you, if you just give me this amount of money, you will have this amount of money come back to you. Yo, you want that? You you want you want that Ferrari, man? Hey, hallelujah! Sow in this seed, or say this prayer. That Ferrari is as good as yours. Oh, you stage four cancer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shut. Oh, mm. you know why your loved one didn't get healed? He would have had he had the faith. They don't understand scripture. Okay, and 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 I I, I could continue with that mindset, but. Understand, you can grow the church with never growing the kingdom. But do you know what's impossible? It's impossible to grow the kingdom without growing the church. Thank you, B-boy. It it is impossible to grow the kingdom of God and never grow the church. Because the two should go hand in hand. The problem is, Pastors and Christians get so fixated on growing the church, which we should. It's critical that we grow the church. It's crucial that we grow the church. It's so important. But we can never substitute growing the kingdom for growing the church. I have led, I have had the honor to lead people to Christ who I knew this church wasn't a fit for them. Right? Hey, man, check out this church. Check out this church. Check out that church. 
I'm not trying to grow the church. First, I'm trying to grow the kingdom. And I know in growing the kingdom, he's going to grow my church. So the kingdom of God is not about the church, but the church should be about the kingdom of God. Jesus gives us all authority in heaven and on earth. Praise the Lord. All right, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. It has been given to me. And then what does he do? Go. Go. Go and baptize uh, uh, people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them all things that I have taught you. Right? Go. It has all the authority has been given to me. Now go. I have given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions, demons of every rank and size, to overcome all the power of the enemy, and by no means nothing shall harm you. Now go. Right? He tells us in Luke that we have that authority. Then he makes it clear in Matthew to us that all authority has been given to him. Now go. Well, who are we going in? We are going in the authority of Jesus. When I I was in the sheriff's department and I had to arrest somebody, I didn't arrest them in the authority of Grant. Truth be told, I didn't even arrest them in the authority of North Carolina. I arrested them in the authority of Doug Dowdy. I arrested them in the authority of the sheriff. That's who I arrested them in. Right? So it's crazy. When we arrest demons by casting them out, we are not arresting them in the authority of, of, of ourselves. We are not arresting them in the authority of a church. We are not arresting them in the authority of a denomination. Please, dear Jesus, don't ever do that. Good gosh almighty, because that demon will tell you quick what's wrong with your denomination. Right? So we don't do that. We arrest in the authority of Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. So make disciples from all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Listen to me, church. That isn't about the church. That's about kingdom. Kingdom growth. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And it is all through his authority that the kingdom of God is spread. And as the kingdom of God is spread throughout all the nations, then thank you, Jesus. It's going to benefit the church. But the church is here. To grow the kingdom. Spirit will grow the church. But grow the kingdom. The church is made up of a bunch of redeemed sinners transformed to saints through the death and the resurrection of that of Christ Jesus. We have been given a calling, an assignment to grow the greater purpose, the kingdom of God. If I can have my worship team come up. And in growing the kingdom of God again, It will indeed grow the kingdom of heaven. People's names will be signed, sealed, delivered in the Lamb's book of life. Then in their obedience, they will indeed get plugged in to the church, to the local church. Everything will be expanded in Jesus' name. But we first do that by growing the kingdom of God. The church is not the kingdom. The church is a workforce or another way through which the kingdom is grown the kingdom of god is about the kingdom of god and the sad truth of the matter is for so many of us christians we know more about our denomination than we do about the kingdom god's kingdom is inside of us we are called to grow god's kingdom matthew 6 10 your kingdom come which is a prayer, again, that he taught his disciples. Yes, uh, it's worship. It's, it's communication with him. It's making sure that his will is done in our lives and done down here through earth. It is our main priority. That is number one. And this passage of Scripture proves to us that growing the kingdom is number one. Jesus, before he asked for the daily bread, Same passage, go to verse 11. But verse 10, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. 
But it's amazing to me that before he asked for a thing, he said, let your kingdom come. It's not about my prayer list. It's not about my diagnosis. It's not about my this. It's not about my want. It's not about my desire. Before, Lord, and I'm going to talk to you about that, but before, Lord, we get into that, Jesus, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. It's all about you. And Jesus, here I am to say, I'm all about you. I just want to be in your presence. I'm not here to get a thing. I'm not here to get a blessing. I'm here to be in your, ble- in your presence because your kingdom come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We love you, God. We give you honor and glory, my King Jesus. And God, I thank you.